From historic downtown Waco, deep in the heart of Texas, this is First Sunday Morning, a ministry of the First Baptist Church of Waco. A part of our community, celebrating fellowship together and sharing ministry with others through the timeless good news of the gospel story of new life in Christ Jesus. This morning we come to baptize our friend Ben Wisman. Ben, ben is a freshman at Baylor and he comes today uh, with a profession of faith in Christ. Ben, we've been so excited to see how God has already begun to, to work in your life and we look forward to the years ahead to see how he grows you and how he continues to, to use you for his kingdom. And so, as, uh, as your brother in Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. I'd like to invite our children to join me for the children's message. Good morning, everybody. How are you? You doing okay? All right, I have a test for you. Does anyone know? Raise your hand and tell me what this is. Okay. Dollar. It is a dollar. It is a dollar bill, U.S. currency. Can you have it? Sure, right there. It's my gift to you. You have not because you asked not, friends. Of course you can. Uh, that is a dollar bill. Uh, now let me tell you about dollars. Dollars are like fire. They're like water. They're like electricity. Do you know what those things have in common? Let me tell you. Fire and water and electricity are things that we need for life, things that are good, things that are gifts but also things that we're taught from the time that we're little are also what? You know the answer to this? Big? Big, yeah, they're big. They're great. 
but they also can be dangerous. Were you taught not to play with fire? Were you taught to be careful around the water? Mm -hmm. Were you taught to respect electricity? Of course you were. Today we're going to learn that the Bible teaches us that money is powerful. And it also is something that we need to learn to respect because it can be dangerous, as all God's good gifts can be if we treat them wrongly. Okay? So uh, I want you to listen later on during the sermon. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you've called us to life and to happiness in you. And we thank you for the wisdom of your word, Lord, that protects and guides and directs our lives. Help us, Lord, to receive your truth and apply it today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Y'all have a great morning. We'll see you later.
morning. Would you all re join me in the responsive reading found in your worship guide, please? We're reading from Romans 8, 35 through 39, and if you will read the bold. <clears throat> Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ our Lord.
Will you share this prayer with me, please? Father, would you hallow this time in our worship service as these friends stand before your altar to receive our tithes and offerings? Would you help us honestly check our own hearts? May we know where we fit on the continuum of giving. There are some who opt out and don't want to be a part. There are some who give just the minimum. There are some who give only as a ritual. But there are some who heard Christ's challenge to give with joy in response to what you have given. Father, help us to remember the costly gift of your son and of the salvation and forgiveness that he offers, of the hope and the purpose that he gives, of the blessings that flow in our life through your presence and your love. May we let this time be a time of reflection, of loving you and responding as you would have us. Prepare our hearts to enjoy the gift of these musicians and of the message that will come that has a personal word for each one of us. God, we thank you for loving us and for giving us each other to love. May we honor you by our worship this day is the prayer we make in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen.
pray together. Our good and our holy God, we ask you to speak. Speak to us, Lord, because your servants are listening. We pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and we say together, amen. Amen. Please be seated. And as you're seated, I invite you to take a Bible and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Our text today is 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. We're picking up on our sermon series, Happiness. Today's theme is God, happiness, and material things. Let's begin reading in verse 6. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these things, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and to any, many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, love, faith, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing for which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in inapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches. But in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Today we're talking about God, happiness, and material things. It's been a while since I've asked you to break out your number two lead pencils, but today is one of those days because I quickly want to walk through three principles and a strategy for having happiness and walking with God and relating to material things. The first principle for our consideration today is this. God has given us material things to enjoy. Both the ascetic and the prosperity preacher fall off the horse, one on one side and the other on the other. God would not have us live our life without simple and gracious comforts. If you go back to the earliest pages of the Bible in the creation narrative, it said that there were trees in the garden that were beautiful to the sight. A number of times I've said in this church, there's no practical reason for magnolias. You don't build anything with magnolias. They shed, they're a nuisance, they make a mess, but oh my goodness, the blossoms. The way they look, the way they smell. Why do we have magnolias? Because God's a whole lot of fun, and he's good, and he's kind to us. Recently, I was in the Museum of the Pacific uh, Theater in, in Fredericksburg, Texas. 
And there was all the beautiful museum. If you've been there, it's an amazing museum. And there was a poem that a father wrote to his son. This, this soldier was in the Solomon Islands in a place called Iron Bottom Bay, a horrible, horrible place. And he wrote this little, this little poem, and he sent it home to his son. And in it, there was a line about home. And this is what he said about home. He said, home is where we can stop to catch our breath. You see, God has given us life, and he has given us Sabbath, and he has given us beauty and simple pleasures for us to catch our breath and to be reminded that we're human beings as well as human doings. And God has given us material things to enjoy. That's the starting place for today. Now, here's the transition. I know you're waiting on it, but, but, but trusting in material things, but leaning on them, asking them to do what God's never asked them to do is a fool's errand. We must learn to enjoy material things in concert with the pleasures of God. To have well-ordered passions, to have well-ordered affections. Which leads us into the next principle, principle number two. And if you still have your principle out, here it is. Trusting and loving material things is both disappointing and dangerous. Let's start with the disappointing because it's a little bit softer. Oftentimes, we create little images. We'll call them idols. We can control them. We can put them in our pockets. They can go with us where we go. They're not nearly as cantankerous as the God of Israel and the Exodus and Pentecost and Easter morning. Not nearly as demanding, but incredibly, incredibly incredibly disappointing and it's been this way for a long time for thousands of years people have been asking material things to do what only God could do we've looked at the blessing and asked the blessings to be the blesser because we can control them all the way back to the book of Ecclesiastes we have this from the preacher I made my works great. I built myself houses. I planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens. Do you hear a theme there? I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools for which to water the growing trees of the grove. I acquired servants and had servants born in my house. Yet I had great possessions and herds and flocks. I had more than all in Jerusalem before me. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings and provinces. I acquired singers, the delights of the sons of men, and musical instruments of all kinds. So I became great and I excelled more than all who were before me. Also, my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. Then, then I looked on all the works of my hands, all the things my hands have done, and the labor in which I toiled, and indeed, all was vanity and grasping after the wind. There was no profit under the sun. After all the accounting was done, after all the profit was counted, he rendered that there was no profit at all. He was disappointed because he asked those things to do what only God could do, and that's give life and meaning and purpose and hope. Asking material things to be God, trusting them, loving them is disappointing. It's also dangerous. The language of this text said that it's a snare and a saber. At first, the snare, uh, it said, those who chase after riches are snared by them. Bait from the adversary who has come only to kill and steal and destroy. So often those shiny things lead our heads into nooses. Like tuna fish in the cage, the raccoon is trapped and oops, we've been duped. 
And it's far too late and we recognize that we have no more wisdom than the beast of the field. Those who run after riches, asking them to give them meaning and purpose and life and vitality are snared by them. But it's also a saver, not just a snare. It said, many who have run after material things in this way, they have pierced, get this, themselves with many sorrows. No one's as big an enemy in our lives as we are. And so often we stick the saber in our own heart. The greedy, grasping life, whatever, whatever label we put on it, is a self-impaling, sorrowful existence, even if we are the envy of our peers. Number one, God has given us material things to enjoy. Number two, trusting and loving material things is disappointing and dangerous. Number three, we are called to flee from the love of money and to pursue godliness for God's glory and for our good. Craig Blomberg, in his book, Christians in an Age of Wealth, wrote that mammon is God's arch competitor for human allegiance. God's biggest foe. And a foe in our own lives. And the Bible gives us a, a simple word. Flee, run, run away, get away. But mammon is like Roscoe P. Coltrane from the Dukes of Hazzard. Remember Roscoe P.? He was always in hot pursuit. As we run from mammon, mammon runs after us. And so we need a strategy. In literature, in film, escape scenes are exciting. My son went to a birthday party recently at an escape room where you came up with a strategy of escape. And that's what this text is in 1 Timothy. Paul gives Timothy a strategy of escape. Escape the snare. Dodge the saber. Follow hard after God. What did he tell him to do? What can we do? Number one, here's the strategy. We can pursue contentment. Go back and meditate over this text. It's a call to contentment, to happiness, to wholeness. Two conversations I had uh, with successful people. One sitting at a table, uh, a successful man reached over, looked at me in the eye, and he said, we are just incredibly hard to please. I thought, my word, that means you have very little pleasure. Remember Churchill? He said, I, he said, my tastes are simple. I only want the very, what? Best. If you take Churchill's statement and you add to it the concept of new and improved, what do you get? Discontent, misery, a chasing after the wind. Proverbs 14, 29 says, A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. It ruins us from the inside out because the target always moves faster, more, better, new, improved. Always moves. We are to pursue contentment. Another successful person gave me the opposite advice, and this one's life-giving. He said, you want to know the secret to financial stability? I said, what is it, sir? He said, learn how to enjoy cheap stuff. <laughs> you're going to want to write that one down. Bottom line, if you're not happy in the little apartment with your needs met, your basic needs met, if you can't be happy there, you will not be happy in the mansion on the lake. I promise you that. I promise you that. So we need to learn to pursue contentment. All right, number two, we need to learn to pursue generosity. 
Again and again in this text, it calls them to be, to be givers, to give, to give freely. Is that because God is hard up? No. Last week, Ryan cited Psalm 50. In that same psalm, God says, If I were hungry, I wouldn't ask you for food. God doesn't need a thing you've got. None of it. But God loves you so much that he's called you to a life of generosity because he knows that frees your heart and makes you alive and makes you happy, makes you whole. Each generation in America, from the builders to the boomers to the Gen Xers to the millennials, have given less and less proportionally to the church and to charity. And are we happier as a nation? No, we're not. Common newspaper reading says we're sick and we look sick unto death. It's because we're grabbing and grabbing and grabbing and grabbing, thinking it's going to make us alive and it disappoints and it's dangerous. And God's called us to pursue generosity. Years ago, Calvin Miller told a beautiful story about how he learned this lesson, the link between generosity and wholeness. He grew up very poor in Oklahoma. This is his story. He says, I'm nearly 50 now, but I well remember the time when I first learned this valuable truth. I was a child, perhaps eight years old, being raised in a family of nine by a mother who was so devoted to her little flock. She had to, the courage to raise us after our father had abandoned us without any visible means of support. Money was always short, but I had come upon a dime and a nickel in a day when dimes were made of real silver and nickels nickel. The two small coins hid in my pocket knife box were several of their brassy counterparts in today's coinage. While they were there, they were mine still. I could not reckon that they should have been mine. It wasn't right that they were mine when my mother worked as a laundress to keep me alive when, when she would come through the door at night with her hair wilted from bending over steaming tubs of laundry for 12 hours, something in me began to revolt at those two tiny, shiny coins in my pocket knife box. What right did I have to keep them when she daily paid such a sacrifice to make my life secure? I tried to give her the coins, but she refused. My land, son, those are yours. So on she worked, and the little coins grew not to like themselves. At last, I thought of what I would do. I took the coins, and I walked a mile and a half into the business district of our little town. At the Cress's store, I found a beautiful little bowl, and so I reckoned it to be. I bought it, and they put it in a little brown sack, which delighted me, for I knew that it would heighten the surprise. I carried the little bowl home again. That night when she came through the door, I gave her the brown sack. I will never forget how proud she seemed to be as she opened the sack. I later had children of my own and came to know that all loving parents have a special way of receiving a child's gift, even when the gift may not be quite so special as the child thinks it to be. Still, it was a time of simple splendor for me. I learned for the first time in my life that self-esteem and self-denial are brothers. And that night as I went to sleep, I felt good about myself just in realizing the coins were no longer in my pocket knife box. I was smiling in the darkness. I still do. Do we smile in the darkness? Do we smile in the darkness? Or in the darkness does the mammon cry out, saying, more, faster, better. We can pursue generosity. And lastly, we can pursue godliness. This, this, life, this is part of a whole life with God. In this section of Scripture, their vices and their virtues and the list are, are, are great. Uh, the vices are arrogance, envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicion, useless wranglings. The virtues, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness, faith. 
as part of a whole life pursuit of God, as God grows the likeness of Christ in us, we are to pursue him with all manner, every category of our lives, even as we relate to material things. God has given us freely and called us to steward. And the way we manage in large measure determines our wholeness and our happiness. We'll end with this story today. Not long ago, I was around a young school teacher. She told a story about when she was young, she was a, a nanny for a family, and they had an odd obsession. Uh, they, they brought into their home dogs. They rescued dogs, kind of like Jean Ann Jones, you know, in the Cavaliers. They brought in their home, but they're a very special, narrow category of dog. Dogs that had been trained to be service animals for people with handicaps. So these dogs could do all kind of high-end things. Uh, they had high levels of skills and talents. Uh, some of you know about Dr. Nan's dog that can, that can sniff out when her body changes and she's about to have a challenge with diabetes. I mean, there are some dogs that can do amazing things in service of people. Well, these, these dogs, they all had skills, they all had talents, and they all had one thing in common. They all failed, totally, completely failed the obedience portion of their training. So these dogs could do wonderful things. They also like to eat your couch, use the bathroom in your kitchen. They weren't nice to other people. They didn't play well with others. Highly skilled, completely rich, and worthless. Man, I'm like that dog sometimes. God has put so much in us, so much in us, he has given us so much, so freely. The things we could do, if only we would do. We got to pursue God. We got to run away from mammon. And in there, there is one of God's little keys to our happiness. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for being who you are and for doing what you do. Lord, we know that you're a good God and that you want us to experience your fullness even as we will in the future, Lord, in measure now. Lord, we pray as we grow, as we walk with you, as we pursue you, that you would give us increasing freedom in every area of our life. And I pray today, Lord, that we would grow in our relationship with you as it relates to material things. Set us free and make us generous and make us happy and make us loving. We pray in your strong name and we say together, amen, amen. Friends, let's stand. This is the hymn we call the hymn of decision. If God has called you to confess your faith in him or to join this church, or if you have needs in your life, we invite you to come as we sing together. David, come and lead us.
Today, it's my privilege to do the benediction, and I ask you to sit for just a moment. Word of personal privilege. Today, after 20 years of service in our church and many decades in faithful ministry uh, to, the, to the kingdom, David Bowen has led his last worship service uh, as the music minister at First Baptist Church. David, we love you. We thank you for your ministry among us. Please join me in that. Yes. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. You can sit or stand. We're going to talk a little while longer. Uh, there are two things we'd like to do today. Cecil will join me in just a moment. But, but one of the ways that people uh, who, who know about Steinway pianos, and this is our beautiful Steinway piano that was acquired during David's ministry, graciously given to our church. Uh, one of the things, when they're played by significant musicians, uh, they're signed. Van Cliburn has signed pianos all over the world. And uh, we will have very few people in the history of our church sign this piano. But today we'd like to ask David if he would sign the piano. And so uh, Peter has opened it up for us over there. David, if you would go here. You're going to need a pen. If you would go over there. If you'd make your way over there and, and sign this piano as an expression of our appreciation and love for you. Thank you, David. David, it's my distinct honor to uh, give to you and Julie airfare to Hawaii. We. Uh, uh, we know that you enjoy going to Hawaii, and uh, here are two checks that will provide airfare for you and your wife, and uh, they're round-trip tickets. <laughs> <laughs> One other thing, in your bulletin today, and I wasn't in the service early this morning, so it may have already been mentioned, but you have a listing of the scholarship donors to the music scholarship for college musicians. This is a program that was started a number of years ago and has served our church extremely well. David, upon you leaving the leadership at First Baptist, we would like to name this scholarship program in your honor. So henceforth, it'll be known as the David Bolin Scholarship for Musicians. And we think this, we will be making a significant contribution to this, uh, this effort in order to provide, continue to provide scholarships for college musicians. We think that this program has been a marvelous gift to the church. It has provided us with extremely great music and we appreciate it so much. Let's stand and pray. Lord, we're grateful for your grace and we are grateful for music. We thank you that you're a singing God and you've called us to be a singing people. May we sing until we see your face. 
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Serve the Lord.